A question to ponder for a moment as we begin. When you are faced with a problem, what is your first instinct? And we don't, uh, we won't discuss it with the neighbor today like we often do or shout it out, but just to ponder it for a moment. When you're faced with a problem and you're feeling like, oh, I don't know what the solution is, what, what is your first instinct? And our good man James addresses that. Some great, great news. We are in the book of James and going through the series here on that. And he says in chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. Meaning, you're not going to get in trouble for asking and it will be given him. I'm going to pause right there. There's more to that verse, but I don't think we're going to get there, so I'll read it if we do. So we'll just go for one verse, one one sentence. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. This is just straightforward, awesome news from someone who has been through the highs and lows and challenges and triumphs of being with Jesus, following Jesus. This is actually Jesus' brother, so he's seen it all. There was even even a season in his own life where he thought Jesus was crazy and tried to stop him from doing ministry. We might get there today, maybe not. So he's come a long way. And he has this confidence now to say that God gives wisdom generously to those who ask. So ask. That's quite a thought. Or another way to say it is your problems have a solution. Every problem has a heavenly solution. And that, that's just good news. So take a moment, sit on that. T- tell your neighbor. Your biggest problem has a heavenly solution. Tell them. Good news. Go. And it's even better with what... That, that was not very excited for some good news, by the way. That, <laughs> it's even better. What James actually says is every problem has a heavenly solution and God wants to generously share it with you. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously wisdom to all who ask. Wow. That's good. If that's who God really is, that is some great news. This is a hugely important mindset because we will all face challenges and problems where we feel like, I don't have a solution. And if you think you always do, just ask the person that knows you best, and they'll tell you about your solutions. (laughs) But if we can believe it, this this is a mindset. This is one of the things I love about James, is he goes after our, our mindsets. How do we approach situations? He started off the book saying, consider it pure joy. Consider it, there's a mindset. Consider it pure joy. So this is how we approach, consider it pure joy when you go through trials. And then he gives us some reasons to. I mean, that's counterintuitive, right? Nobody wants to go through a trial. But he's trying to help us have a heavenly mindset. What's God's perspective? What does God want to do? And this is very, very similar. There's a mindset here. When you lack wisdom, you have a problem and you don't know the solution, what's your mindset? And he is is wanting us to go after That if you believe that God, when you have a problem and you don't know the answer, if you believe that God generously wants to give you his wisdom, he generously wants to bring forth a heavenly solution, that'll completely change how we think about problems. Will it not? I mean, isn't one of the hardest part of having a problem or the most anxiety-inducing in part is of having a problem is 
when you don't feel like you have a solution. So you just kind of feel stuck, like this is hard and I don't know what the solution is. I don't know how to respond well to the situation. I'm lacking the wisdom. That amplifies the problem a lot. So if we can, have, if we can gain this, this mindset here, it can change dramatically how we go through situations where we don't have an immediate solution. There's something here that, that is just golden. To, to follow Jesus, to believe this truth, is to be able to walk through life with every problem that we face and have a mindset that's, that says there's always a solution. I mean, just think about some challenges you face and you get to the end of your own wisdom and it's like, oh, it's hard. What would it be like to be able to walk through life with a confidence that says, no matter what I face, there is always a solution. There is a heavenly solution. I try to build this in to our kids. I, I say this a lot, especially as our oldest is now 16, and man, life's real. There's, there's all sorts of challenges. By, your, by the time you're 16, I mean, you are facing adult-level challenges and so it's 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 important. We're trying to we try to build it in as when he go as as when he faces this problem, just to speak that truth. Hey, remember, buddy, I know it's it's this is tough. And we're not minimizing that, but let's put it into practice. There's always a solution. We don't know it yet, and we're not pretending it doesn't exist, but let's look forward in advance. There's always a solution. And then it's super fun. To when, it's, when the solution presents itself and God comes through to be able to look back and be like, look, you know, three days ago, we, you were freaking out about this situation and it's real, but how cool is this? God brought a solution. And how powerful could that be if we could build that into ourselves and our kids that when we're walking through life, our mindset is no matter what we face, there's always a heavenly solution. Let me give you a couple examples here. In the book of Luke, there's a story about Peter, and he had a problem. He's a fisherman that didn't catch any fish. That's an inherent problem, <laughs> okay? Not only are you going to be hungry, you're going to be broke. So here's, here's where the story picks up. In Luke 5, it says, one day Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. So he got into one of the boats, which assumes that he already knows Peter at some level. This is like early interaction, but you don't just steal a dude's boat. So he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put it out from shore a little. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, We've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll, I'll let down the nets. So, I mean, let's pause for a moment here. This is, Peter is a professional fisherman. It's what he does every day. It is his craft. It is his skill. He is a master. He is not a novice. He has his own boats. So he is like the owner of a business. And Jesus comes along, and Jesus is not a fisherman. He is a carpenter by trade. And so this carpenter, who's got some good teachings, gets in your boat and says, hey, dude, go out there and try again. How are you going to respond if that's some dude who's not in your line of work showing up at your business telling you how to do it after you just failed? So it happened. This is, this is kind of the real life stuff of what's going on. So when they had done so, they let it down their nets, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat, come help. And they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Now there's another problem that <laughs> needs a solution. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and says, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. 
for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. So Peter, a fisherman, this is his sustenance, this is his livelihood, it's how he feeds his family, it's how he takes care of things. He has a problem. He worked all night and got nothing. That's a problem. What's the solution? Jesus comes along and bam! Just an interesting question to look back. So what was the heavenly solution to that situation? Was it that God is trying to teach Peter through Jesus that my provision for you, my provision for you is far greater than anything you can do on your own strength? Or maybe it's God is a good God of abundance and he cares about you and your family being taken care of. Or maybe it's when, God's, when God shows up, it is way better than anything you can muster up on your own strength. Or maybe is it, trust me when I speak. Or maybe it's, man, God's timing is amazing. It's really frustrating, but it's amazing. Or is it simply, I might be a carpenter, but I'm also a better fisherman than you. I don't know. One of those is probably the heavenly solution that Jesus is desiring that Peter would learn. Another example of a heavenly solution is when Jesus says some incredibly challenging words about how do we respond to hurtful people. We've all been hurt by people. We've probably all hurt people. We're all broken, imperfect people. So how do you respond to that? What's the solution when we're at the end of our wisdom, when we just don't know, we want to make the, the situation better, but this person keeps hurting me and I don't know what to do. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't have the answer. What does Jesus have to say? Because those questions that we might ask and we might feel and those situations that are real to us now same in 2,000 years ago. So Jesus says it like this. In Luke 6, he says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But I say love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. You will show yourselves to be children. I added that, show yourself. You will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your heavenly Father is merciful. <laughs> that is one of the most challenging, incredible teachings of all time. No other religious leader or religion or guru or anybody says anything remotely like that. Jesus has a heavenly solution to the problem of evil and hard situations and hurtful people and he's flowing right from the heart of the father and he's saying pour out a goodness and an undeserved grace and a mercy that yeah they don't deserve it but neither do you but how does God treat you so pass that on overcome evil with good yeah they wronged you they hurt you I know that I see that that's not okay you can set healthy boundaries that's another message from Jesus from another time but do good to him pray for them. Overcome that evil with goodness. 
That is a heavenly solution that was never said in the history of humanity until Jesus. And then some people copied him afterwards. But that, this is a wisdom from above. And he's generously just wanting to, to give it out. I remember being so proud of my wife as I watched her put this into action. There was a, a, a tough situation when my middle son was in kindergarten. So it was like six, seven years ago. And so he's going to the, the on-campus daycare at school at, so that he can line up, that we can line up when he's out of kindergarten with when we pick up our older son so we're not you know, going to school seven times a day and all that great stuff. You know. So we're gonna pick him up together. So there's just this, this one day, and he has a very nice, the, the, the lady who works in there is very sweet. We, he likes her, we like her, it's a great, great situation. Uh, but this one day, uh, my wife goes and, and, and picks up our, our son, and the lady in there just, just goes off on her, just lays into her about how we didn't sign him out properly yesterday, and, you know, that was it. <laughs> that was all it was. But it was just this unloading of anger and, and spite and vitriol I mean she went off it wasn't like hey do this tomorrow it was like just wham and so she came home and was like I, I, wow that scares me I don't know if our son should be in there should we tell the principal what what do you do in this situation this lady just went crazy on me and it's like, well, yeah, you, you should go to the principal, right? I mean, that's, that's wrong. It's not okay for our son to be treated that way. What do we do? So we're, but it's like, this is hard. What's the solution? What's, what's God's heavenly solution? Because we're at the end of our own thing. So between teachings like this of Jesus and, and, and praying, she came up with the idea on her own, or I believe it was the Lord leading through God's word and, and the spirit. She ended up not going to the principal, not going in the classroom and crushing the lady and going off on her she wrote a letter and she felt compelled to just write a letter and and tell this woman all of the just the wonderful things that we appreciate about her and how she's taking great care of our son this year and just essentially a letter of appreciation and so we she i don't remember how she got it whether we sent it with daniel or turned it in or whatever you gave it to her so she reads it and just you know, she's probably expecting a fight. She's probably expecting, I'm going to tell the principal, you're a horrible person, you know, that's what you deserve. But this woman's just undone. And then she goes and ends to this long conversation with Dawn about how her daughter had died this year. And, and I don't remember if it was the anniversary of her daughter's death, but it was just her daughter's death was on her mind and she apologized and, you know, so sorry for going off on you. And just ended up this beautiful time of reconciliation and love and she's you know great great relationship and it was one of those moments where it's like in our own flesh oh we know what we wanted to do you know <laughs> we had our solution and it would be just you know but that's the kind of stuff but in the end does that bring heavenly solutions does that bring more of the kingdom and so this is it was a, a great example to me of like whoa what jesus says actually works sometimes <laughs> let's let's maybe try it more let's listen let's not just try to do it on our own wisdom that runs out quickly every problem has a heavenly solution and god wants to generously share it with us when we ask one thing I want to highlight is we, you, if you are new with us, we love listening to the Holy Spirit. We believe it is one of the most incredible, real, awesome gifts and privileges that we have as beloved children of God. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. He says, I have not left you as orphans, but I will give you the Holy Spirit and he will lead you into all truth. So we know and we love that God speaks today, now, real, in real ways, very personal ways, very powerful ways. The Holy Spirit loves to speak. With that said, though, as we're looking to heavenly solutions, I would be remiss and felt really strong that the Lord wanted to remind us 
that one very, very crucial way to ask God for wisdom, to seek those heavenly solutions, is to dig into God's word until he speaks with a heavenly solution. The Bible, wow. Thank you, God, for the Bible. That is the greatest source of, of wisdom the world has, period. I mean, some people say, I, I hear critiques, they're like, oh, the Bible's old. It's out of date. It's, it's not relevant to, to 21st century questions and problems. And I'm like, name something better. In all the books ever written from all time across all cultures, there's never been a book, 66 books, with a coherent message written by over 30 people over hundreds of years on several different continents that puts forth a coherent, comprehensive worldview that answers all of life's big existential questions about who we are and why we exist and what our purpose is and how we're meant to live, especially when you get into the, the New Testament and the, the, the description of this new creation or the kingdom of God that we are invited into, especially when you get into the words of Jesus, you have a revelation of wisdom that is found nowhere else in existence. And I'm happy to compare specifics with anybody. I mean, there's no one like Jesus. I was talking to a person a few weeks back who, who believes this, you know, the Bible, all that, it's, it's just, it doesn't have the answers. It's not relevant anymore. They kind of had this perspective of like, they've, they've been enlightened above the Bible now. It's just a human book. It's all old thinking. And so a fair question, anytime you're talking about, okay, well, what's your, what's your worldview? Where are you coming from? Share with me your wisdom. And where do you get it? And so they started laying out, you know, some, some uh, tenets, if you will, of their ethics, of what they think we need to do in the world to be good people, to essentially be, yeah, be good people, if you will. And just in the midst of that, I was like, Hmm. You keep going back to like these couple cornerstones that they sound oddly familiar <laughs> to me. They sound like this guy I know. This guy I know named Jesus. As you talk about, we need to have compassion for the poor. And you need to take care of the outcast and live this life of compassion. Do you know that those values were literally non-existent in human history until Jesus came on the scene. Like, you can't sit here and espouse this worldview of incredible compassion, care for the poor, human rights. That's nowhere until Jesus. Jesus is your source, brother. You know, whether you want to admit it or not. And he's like, no, you know, he's just a good teacher. Yeah, yeah, I, okay, I admit he's got a lot of things to say. No, 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 no. That dude, that guy you like, also said he was God. Amen. And that he's here to save you from your sins that you can't save yourself from. And that you're made for a relationship with God and you need him. And he's the only way to the Father. And he's here to establish his kingdom reigning on earth. Amen. So that's either cuckoo or he's the king of kings. I mean, you can't just pick a little, oh yeah, cool, cool, Jesus. No. Uh-uh. You can't grab his teachings as the cornerstone of your ethics and then just say he's a good dude. That's just intellectually just wacko. So, when we're lacking wisdom, our first instinct should be get into God's word until he speaks. Most of the problems we face are actually really clearly, most things are not even ambiguous. Most things are incredibly clearly laid out in God's word. And being in relationship with him, and that's the rooted, grounded, that's where it starts, that's where things make, seem to make sense, in relationship with him, everything in life starts to fall into place and make sense. Our first instinct, though, has got to be get into God's Word. 
It reminds me of yesterday morning. I was driving up the mountain, and it's like six o'clock in the morning, which for me might be may as well be two o'clock in the morning. You know, I'm just I'm not that dude. Um, I was fine driving home at midnight last night, but like six a.m. You know, that's for special people. So I saw I saw these signs. I come across. I'm driving up the Big Bear Mountain, and uh, I see this red light. You can put that first one up there here. I took these at night on the way home, so it's a little different, but the same sign was there. Uh, I wasn't thinking on the way up the mountain. Like I said, I was asleep. Um, So the sign says, wait for green, and then it it switches, and it says, uh, avoid head-on crash. And when you put those things together, it says, wait for green, avoid head-on crash. And so, like I said, I'm really not even awake, but I see a red light. I've been driving for like 20 years or something, so there's this subconscious thing, like red light, like slow down. So it takes me a while. I'm like, I, why am I stopping? It's in the middle of the mountain road. I mean, it's literally halfway up the mountain. There's no signals if you know that road. You don't stop, but I, I stopped because of a red light. And, and so I'm kind of groggily, you know, starting to pay attention. Oh, oh, there's a sign, and it says, wait till green. Oh, okay, cool, I'm doing that. <laughs> avoid head-on crash whoa okay but then i'm looking and it's like dude it's like six in the morning there's no one on the mountain i see the path like okay so there's kind of cones on one side like this light is i'm here like a minute like i got stuff to do why don't i just go you know be fine right you know thankfully the the better side of me got got the got one that time and i waited and you know sure enough cars came like 10 seconds later and a whole line and then it was my turn and i went and so i saw you know those two lanes there's cones on one and at first i'm like okay cool i'm really glad because there was going to be a head-on collision and and you know i could have gone on the right i could have gone just over to the cones that's not really bad right so and then i go around this corner and uh, that lane just stops because the bridge is out (laughs) and there's like just these little two by fours you know, they're repairing the bridge, which always makes you feel good when you're going up the mountain road and you're driving over, you know, two by fours or they're right there, you know. So I passed through and I was like, all right, that was, that was interesting. But immediately I felt like the Lord reminded me, this message is on my mind. It's like, that's what God does with his word. That most of the problems we face actually have really clear solutions if we dig into God's word. We're often, often wondering why, like, why does it feel like life just, my life just flew off the cl- cliff or I just had a head-on collision? And God's like, I put multiple signs in front of you, bro. Like a thousand pages worth of multiple signs that if you look to me and dig in, I will show you the way. There will be heavenly solutions. There is a clear heavenly solution to almost any problem. I remember one. This was like, <laughs> this is hard to be a part of. So this guy comes like, this is like a super long time ago, like a dozen years ago. None of you know this person. And some, this guy comes into my office as soon as I like became a pastor and he comes in my office. He's got marriage problems. All right. Well, let's see what happens. <laughs> so he's, comes in with his wife so his wife he and wife are there and he starts right in and he says you know we've got marriage problems and he begins to explain in front of his wife and you know i i, I think our, our our marriage problems are and he says it totally serious our marriage problems are are rooted in uh, she doesn't understand biblical submission <laughs> red light brother <laughs> head on collision coming here we go. And then he even ups himself by starting to not so, uh, not so uh, covertly intimate that much of what he's talking about has to do with the bedroom. Woo! Woo! <laughs> like, brother, just get off the road. This is not going to end well for you. There is a head-on collision. She's going to throw you off the cliff. Come on. 
But it was serious where he was like, hey, yeah, I, I, I heard this one Bible verse about submission. That's a solution to all our problems. And I'm like, go read the passage. That whole passage that you're referring to starts with this. Husbands and wives submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So first of all, you got some issues, brother, if you think this is just a one-way street. And then it goes on to say, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and laid down his life for her, meaning he gave up his own needs, his own wants, his own comfort to die to bring her alive. Could that possibly have any positive impact on your relationship, Mr. Sexual Submission? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think it's really clear what your problems are, and it's not anything that you've just said to me, but it's right in God's Word. Right there. That was the big blinking red light, brother. God was trying to say, hey, man, <laughs> wait for the green. Avoid the head-on collision. And many, if not all, of life's problems are, are clearly, clearly laid out. So that first instinct has got to be looking for wisdom, get into God's word. We need the heart of Peter, really. The heart of Peter as he encountered God's heavenly solution, he responded like this, or before he even knew it. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. If we would go to his word and his spirit with the belief that he wants to generously give heavenly solutions and have our hearts ready to say, <laughs> whatever my perspective is coming in, because you say so, I'll do it our life will be filled more and more with heavenly solutions. I will sing a new song I will sing a new song I will dance a new